Hello world! So in this video, I'm going to give an overview of the DS5 framework and motivate as to why we need yet another framework while we have frameworks like Langchain and Llama Index. So I'm going to start with an overview of the different building blocks of the DS5 framework such as the signature, modules, language model and optimizers etc. And I'm going to end the video by implementing a quick pipeline for multi-hop question answering which is slightly more complicated compared to a normal question answering pipeline and we're going to compile it in order to optimize the pipeline and finally I'm going to show the difference between the compiled and the uncompiled version and hopefully by the end of this video you'll have a better understanding of how to use DSPy in order to build efficient pipelines and how to improve your pipeline whenever you use DSPy rather than just implementing with any other framework and just letting it run without optimizing it. So most of the code used in the video is taken from DSPy documentation, but I've still made a notebook and I've put all the code together and the link for the notebook is available in the description below. So without further ado, let's get started. So what is DSPy? So DSPy is a framework for algorithmically optimizing your language model prompts and the weights. So these days, we, even though the language models are quite sophisticated, we cannot escape building a pipeline. For example, if we can easily have a retrieval system that goes with the language model and we can have more than one database from which we retrieve the documents. And we can also have multiple language models, each specialized in different tasks. So in order to deal with this complex pipeline, we generally have to break down the problem into different steps. And then we need to prompt your language model well until each of the steps works in isolation. So basically, if we have two language models, then you will have to prompt engineer each of the language models separately. And putting them together is completely another story. Tweaking the steps to work together is quite challenging. And currently, this is a hard and messy problem and there's no good solution for this available until DSPy came into picture. So to make this more systematic and much more powerful, DSPy does two things. Let's find out what it does first. So it separates the flow of your program from the parameters, say which are the language model prompts and the weights. And secondly, DSPy introduces optimizers. So these optimizers can be used to tune both the prompt and the weights so that we actually don't have to worry about prompt engineering at all. So DSPy converts the training of the end-to-end -end pipeline into a programming problem rather than a prompt engineering problem. So they also compare uh, the programming in DSPy to programming in PyTorch. So if you want to implement a neural network in PyTorch, then we typically have uh, two functions. One is the init where we actually define the different layers, for example, the convolution layer and the linear layer. And then we have the second function, which is the forward function, which takes the input X and passes it through all these different uh, layers that we defined in the init. And finally, it gives the output. So similarly, in DSPy, in order to define a program, we need to inherit from the dspy.module and each module has a unit function and to the init we pass different parameters and inside that we define things like a retriever or chain of thought or whatever we want to build in the pipeline and then whenever we are given an input for example in a question answering system the question is the input and that gets passed to the forward function and the input is then processed through all these different components of the end-to-end -end pipeline Finally, we get the output of prediction from the DSPy prediction module. This is typically how we program in DSPy. So to summarize the analogy between uh, PyTorch and DSPy, so we define neural network architectures in PyTorch, but in DSPy, we define programs. And within the programs, we define how different components interact with each other. And in PyTorch, we train the models and in DSPy, we compile the models and it's equivalent to training the models in PyTorch. And in PyTorch, we have a loss which we need to optimize for. So in DSPy, we have an evaluation metric 
which we need to optimize for. And lastly, we have optimizers like Stochastic Gradient Descent and Adam. But when it comes to DSPy, we have teleprompters, which has been renamed to optimizers quite recently. For examples are like Bootstrap, uh, FewShot, and MyPro, etc. Now that we have an overview of why we need DSPy, let's look at the different building blocks of DSPy. So the main building blocks are the language models, signature modules, and data metrics optimizers, which was previously uh, teleprompters. So let's look at language models. So language models, as the name suggests, is where you actually define the language model or the large language model that you're going to be using, which then turns into the heart of the uh, DSPy. For example, if you want to use an OpenAI model, then all you have to do is dspy.openai and then provide the model name. And then uh, you will have to configure DSPy. So this is important. You'll have to tell DSPy what the model that you're going to use. So you'll have to use configure for that. So when you do dspy.configure and then say LM is uh, GPT-3 Turbo, then you're saying that you're going to be using OpenAI's GPT-3 Turbo model. So if you want to use a different model, say for example, Olama, you will have to do something like this, where you say dspy.olama-local and then provide the model name. If you don't have the Olama model downloaded locally, you will end up in an error. So in order to pull the Olama models, you will have to do Olama run by latest. Uh, if you want to pull any other model, for example, if you want to pull the Mistral model, then you'll have to do Olama run Mistral latest. So my rationale behind choosing the uh, model was just the model size. So if you look at the uh, Olama library, we can see that the different models that are available there. I started with the Gemma model. I looked at the size of the quantized model, which is uh, 5.2 gig uh, for a four bit quantized. I felt that was a little bit larger than what I wanted to play with. Then I looked into Mistral. So Mistral had a size of still 4.1 gig, which is still larger than the size I can think of managing locally. So I chose the Phi model and the Phi model is a four bit quantized and it's just 1.6 gig. And I think this is sufficient to just sort of demonstrate the capabilities of DSPy as we are not mainly focused on the language model, but we are going to focus on the entire pipeline in this occasion. Once we have the Olama model loaded, we also have to configure it. We need to say dspy settings.configure and then pass the language model and also the maximum token size that the model is going to use. So let's move on to signatures. Signature is a declarative specification of input-output behavior of a DSPy module. Signature is what allows you to tell the language model what it needs to do rather than specify how it needs to do. So all that we are doing with Signature is just telling it what it needs to do. And we don't care how DSPy manages to do what it needs to do. For example, if you're dealing with question answering, the signature for question answering is just question hyphen uh, greater than answer. So when we specify this in the signature, DSPy takes care of uh, dealing with the prompt and we are really not worried how uh, the prompt is formed and like what's the best prompt for the model and et cetera, et cetera. So when we are dealing with a sentiment classification, we just say sentence and the output is a sentiment. And we can also provide context, for example, if you're using rack like we need to provide the output of rack as a context to the language model so in this case we just uh, separate the context and the question with a comma and then at the output we have the answer of course so let's look at a couple of examples of signatures let's take the example of sentiment classification so and then uh, let's take a sentence which says what is llm for the classification we just say dspy predict and then we pass the signature which is a uh, sentence to sentiment and then whenever we provide the sentence as input to the uh, classify object we just get the sentiment of the sentence which in this case is neutral so in another example let's try to do some summarization so the signature for summarization is document to summary. And if we just pass the signature to this chain of thought module, we'll have a look at the module soon. Whenever we pass the input document to the summarize object, then we just get the response, which is summarized. So it's, that, it's as simple as that. So the next building block of DSPy is the modules. So think of modules as equivalent to the modules in PyTorch. So the purpose of the DSPy module is to abstract away the prompting techniques. 
So when it comes to PyTorch modules, the purpose of it is to, for example, implement a layer in a neural network or even to implement an end-to-end -end architecture, uh, we have to use modules. Similarly, in DSPy, whenever we want to abstract away any prompting techniques, then we'll have to use uh, DSPy modules. For example, one of the well-known prompting technique is DSPy chain of thought. So if we want to abstract away chain of thought, all that we have to do is to implement a chain of thought class and we have to inherit from a DSPy module. And we of course have the uh, init function and the forward function. And in the init function, uh, we take the signature and we process the signature and we split it into input and output fields. And to the output field, we simply append uh, reasoning let's think step by step so we all know that we if we add a line let's think step by step we are going to ask the llm to think step by step or in other words we're going to get the uh, chain of thought prompting so this is a naive implementation of a uh, chain of thought all we have to do is add this line to the output fields and then we have to compose the signature and pass the compose signature to the predict. And predict takes care of composing your output from the uh, chain of thought module. So there are six modules that come out of the box from DSPy. So first one is the predict, which is the basic predictor, and then a chain of thought, which, which we just saw. And the third one is the program of thought, which teaches the language module to output code whose execution results will dictate the response. And then we have the well-known React. And then we also have multi-chain comparison, which can compare multiple outputs from chain of thought to produce a final prediction. And then we have majority, which is nothing but just a voting to return the most popular response uh, from the set of predictions. So the next module in DSPy is data. So DSPy being a machine learning framework, we do have to deal with data. So you can deal with training set, development set, and test set. And Typically, there seems to be three types of values, which is the inputs, the intermediate labels, and the final labels. Now, you can get away with uh, without the intermediate labels and the final labels whenever you don't have label data, but you do have to provide some inputs if you want to uh, train with some examples. And the main class for dealing with data is the dspy.example. For example, for a question answering task, all you have to do is dspy.example, and then you have to pass the question. This is a question and the answer. Whenever you have uh, multiple examples in your, or you have to actually form a data set, then you can create a list. And inside the list, you could have different dspy example objects and each object can have question and the corresponding answer. So the next module or the next component or building block of DSPy is the metrics. So what is a metric? A metric is just a function that will take examples from your data and take the output of your system and then return a score that quantifies how good is the output. Now this is very much similar to the metrics that we have while training neural networks. For example, if you are training for classification, we have the accuracy as the metric. Similarly, based on the task that you're doing, the metric could be just accuracy or the exact match or the F1 score. And this may be the case for simple classification or like for a simple question answering task. However, for more complex application, your system will output long format outputs and the outputs can range from you know a float or an integer or a boolean score so a simple metric can be implemented with just as a function for example if you want to find out how the predicted output is compares to the actual output that you're expecting then you could just write one line function uh, which literally compares the input to the output and returns a boolean there are also some couple of built-in metrics for example there's answer exact match and answer passage match or it can be more complex for example validate context and answer where you actually get the context and then you validate it based on whether a trace is provided or not the last but the most important building block of dspy is the optimizers so what is an optimizer a dspy optimizer is an algorithm that can tune the parameters of your dspy program it could be the prompts or it could be the language model weights it's all decided by dspy whether it's going to tune the prompts or whether it's going to tune the language model weights but the input that we have to provide to the optimizer is your dspy program 
and you'll have to provide the metric that you're optimizing for which we defined using a function and then we'll have to provide a few training inputs like i mentioned before while talking about the data building block it can be labeled or it can be unlabeled and they say that uh, this can be very small as with only five or ten examples and it can be as high as 500 examples and it can be incomplete with only the inputs to your program without any labels and whenever we have these inputs we are now ready to actually optimize your dspy program so what does the optimizer tune this is equivalent to a neural network tuning the parameters of the neural network using gradient descent in case of dspy it consists of different language models stacked together to form a pipeline and so it can either tune the language model weights or it can tune the instructions or it can tune the demonstrations of the input output behavior they mentioned that dspy can optimize all of these three with multi-stage optimization algorithms so what are those optimization algorithms so we have a few which are labeled few shot bootstrap few shot and bootstrap few shot with random search and we have few more options for instruction optimization or whether you're doing automatic fine tuning you have bootstrap fine tuning and whether you're doing program transformations there's k nearest neighbor and ensemble but which optimizer should you use so they say that as a rule of thumb you need to be using bootstrap few shot with random search so they've also given a few guidelines for example if you have very little data for example just 10 examples then you can get away with bootstrap few shot but if you have slightly more data for example 50 then you can use bootstrap few shot with random search and if you have even more data you can use my pro and if you're able to use one of these with a large language model, then you can probably use bootstrap fine tune. So this is how you control what actually is getting optimized. For example, if you want to optimize the language model along with the prompt, then you're probably better off using bootstrap fine tune, which I believe is going to fine tune your language model based on the samples that you're providing. So how do we use the optimizer? Let's say we want to use the bootstrap few shot with random search. So we have to import that first from DSPy uh, teleprompt module, and then we have to define a config. So this config is based on the compute that you've got at your disposal for example you can define the number of threads based on the machine that you're using once you have the config defined you just have to create an object of the bootstrap few shot with the random search class by passing the config and you also have to pass the metric that you're optimizing for so once we pass the config and the metric we have the teleprompter and this teleprompter needs to be compiled now this is equivalent to saying dot train in pytorch or any other module so once we have this teleprompter all we have to do is teleprompter dot compile now think of it as equivalent to dot train in any other neural network library. You have to pass the program that you are compiling and you also have to provide the training set with which you are actually compiling. And hopefully by the end of this compilation process, you have the optimized program and you can readily save the optimized program, load it and use it as your pipeline. To save the program, all you have to do is program.save and you have to provide the local path in your machine where you're actually saving it and then whenever you want to load the program you just have to create an object of the program and then you have to do object.load and then you have to provide the path where you actually stored the compiled program and hopefully you have an optimized pipeline with which you can play around and Hopefully it's better in terms of the metric compared to the metric that it produces without compiling 